Hey everyone, how's it going today? CSS Audio was kind enough to send out their newest bookshelf speaker kit. This kit is something new for them. It's a budget offering that in many ways showcases what CSS has to offer the audio community. It's the Tori, and it's their most affordable kit to date. I think the goal here was to bring new people into high-end audio, or possibly you're already deep into audio equipment, and you want to tread into the DIY waters and see what that's all about. The Tori includes a slightly scaled down version of their LD22 tweeter and a brand new 5.5 inch glass fiber woofer. CSS states that the woofer utilizes distortion reducing shortening rings in the motor to improve accuracy and transparency. All that sounds really good, but we'll have to revisit that statement in a later part of the build. So what's been holding you back in the past from a DIY speaker build? Does the crossover part concern you? Or maybe it's your first time soldering. Honestly, don't even worry about it. These come with a 3D printed board that is basically like a paint by the number. Just connect all the A's, B's, etc. together. And I'll walk you through all that in my crossover construction in the second half of this video. As you'll see during this build, they make it about as easy as it gets. You could honestly have one of these together in a single day if you wanted. Me on the other hand, I made some interesting decisions with the cabinet at the end of part one that made this a little more complicated. But that's really the fun of these DIY projects. You can keep it simple or you can get creative with things like the finish or the cabinet design. And that's really, I think, where a lot of the fun is. But let's get into the build. What I have here is the Bessie strap clamps. These are pretty slick for cabinet and box building. They draw the pressure in evenly and the material resists glue. I use clamps as well, as you'll see, but these are a good starting point to hold things together like this. My glue of choice on something like this is Type On 2. It holds really well and gives you a decent amount of set time. I'm using just a foam brush to apply it. I mean, you could just use your fingers, but just know you're going to make a big mess. And as you can see, I already have some paper down on my uh, Bora centipede table, which is also another convenient find. In a small shop like this, I can easily just fold this up and put this away really simply. The advice I would give you on something like this is to just make sure you glue all the seams on each piece you're working with. You don't want to put them in the clamps and then have to go back and try to get the glue in as you go. It's better to just glue it all and get it in there. And speaking of glue it all, you don't have to go crazy either. I've seen a lot of these where there's about a gallon of glue dripping off the sides of these. You just need enough to completely fill the seam, have contact on both pieces. Ideally, what we'll want to see when we put this all together, we'll apply pressure and we'll get a thin bead coming out of each seam. So earlier I mentioned this Type On 2 has a decent amount of set time. You get a decent amount of time to play with this, but you don't get a long time. This isn't the kind of thing where you can really go play around or make yourself some coffee or something like that. Once you start applying the glue, you really have to move pretty quickly and uh, just get everything into place or you'll start to notice things are starting to set up. And you really want to have it in place before it sets up because as you notice, we don't use any fasteners with this build and that's because they're not required. The glue bond is actually stronger than the wood itself, so that's really all that's needed. In my footage a little later on, I'll show you guys the squeeze out that I'm talking about too. Kind of give you something to shoot for as far as the amount of glue you should use on something like this. So now I'm going to apply the second strap clamp. And in all reality, you could probably use these two, get away with it, and be done right here, but you might not get quite the clamping force you're looking for. There's all kinds of different methods for cabinet and box building. I mean, you can get a nice tight bond using tape with the right methods, so it's not unreasonable to think that this is enough. But in my case, I am going to continue on and slap about 47 clamps on it. You know, the good old, this ain't going anywhere. Now that I've started applying pressure, you can see that bead of glue coming out around all the seams there. It's a nice even bead that follows the seam as you go. If you see that, you're likely good to go. And in all reality, if you have a gallon of it leaking out, it's not going to be the end of the world either. You're just going to have a little more cleanup to do after. Check out the inside of the box too. You'll see that same even bead. And that way you know that this box is really gonna be sealed tight. Now here's something I would suggest doing before this fully cures. Otherwise it's gonna be a lot more work to get this sanded smooth. Clean up your glue lines that are leaking out. 
The glue, like I said earlier, is stronger than the wood. So when you have to clean this up and sand it, it's gonna be a bit of a problem to keep things square and flat. If you get to it early enough, you can just use a rag with water, or if you let it set up a little bit longer, you can just scrape it off and it'll come off in a nice clean line. Just a quick disclaimer, since we're gonna be routing as well as sanding MDF, I would suggest a respirator like this, or at least an N95 mask. Working with MDF isn't exactly like smelling the roses, so it's better to just use a little protection and be safe. You could just jump to sanding if you wanted at this point, but what I'm gonna use is a router with a trim bit. In this case, I'm using a downcut spiral trim bit. And what that has is just a bearing on the end and it will clone whatever surface it's riding on. So that way you'll remove a lot of that glue and also your joints are gonna be really clean. What I would generally suggest if you're routing like this, you'll typically route in a way that your bit is gonna be pointing at the ground. The way I was doing it today was a little bit more so that the camera could see it because you know, this isn't a podcast, this is, well, YouTube. And they're my fingers, so I can lose them if I want to. If you take a look at that box now, you can see just how clean this is. After you run that router on there, it removes almost all of the work that you'd have to do with sanding. Sanding turns into more of just a minor touch-up. Depending how accurate you were with your glue earlier, you may have some still in the box like I did. What I like to do is just take a razor blade after that, try to remove as much as you can before you start sanding, because like I mentioned earlier, that glue is gonna be stronger than the wood, so it'll just make the sanding job a lot easier and give you a nice, smoother finish with much less effort. If we look at this box now, it's pretty much ready to go. At this point, you'd be almost ready to start veneering this, or if you were going with uh, certain finishes like a Duratex, you'd actually be ready to apply that and could finish this in the same day. Now for the crossover board. These are 3D printed and labeled really cleanly. It's super easy to put together. As long as you can read numbers, you're pretty much gonna be set here. What's nice about this is really on two fronts. One, I would say it's really good that everyone can do this and you don't have to be able to read complicated crossover schematics. And two, it gives you a finished product that actually looks really good. It's hard to mess this up and everything is gonna look really clean when you're done. What I'm doing now is putting everything into their slots, as well as putting the leads through the holes and then just folding them over so it's a little easier to work with. The kit comes with everything you need to put this together, minus just some simple soldering tools. Uh, it comes with all the connections you'll need, all the jumpers, the zip ties that I'm applying now. The zip ties have designated holes and are really easy to get everything nice and secure. If you wanted to take it a step further, you could use hot glue, but I really didn't find it necessary. It was really locked in how it was. To get that secure fit I was talking about that you don't need any hot glue, I would suggest taking something like a needle nose plier and using that to really lock these in a little bit tighter. You can snug them up with that. And then just trim off all the ends and this is gonna look pretty good. As you can't see here off camera a little bit, I'm cleaning my solder tip. And this is really what it should look like as you start each joint. The red wires I'm working with here are the included jumpers. You have to cut these to length, so it takes a little bit of figuring on where these go. But this is what I was talking about earlier, when really all we're doing is connecting the letters. You need all of the A's to connect to the A's, all the B's to connect to the B's. There may be more than two B's. In the end, we really just need all the letters to join together. You can see that I'm twisting the jumpers and trying to make a physical connection. This is really what you want to do on something like this. You shouldn't rely on the solder as your main connection point. The twisted connection actually has less resistance than the solder, so that's really where your primary connection should be. I would say the longest part of this whole thing was probably just figuring out the routes and where I wanted some of these to run so it was nice and clean when I was finished. One suggestion I would have would be running some of your jumpers underneath your zip ties. That can help clean it up a little bit. Another might be to just lay it out first and kind of plan things so that you don't end up just running wires over the top of each other and a really big mess when you're finished. The six holes on the bottom are gonna be your input as well as your connections to your woofer and your tweeter. 
This cable is included as well, so just cut the insulation back to what you need, and then just join it up with the letters just like all the other wires. When you get to some of these connections that have a lot of things coming in into one, uh, you can start that off twisting it by hand, but you should really finish it with something like a pliers. It's just going to help you to get a nice clean solder joint when you get to that point. So while I'm building these, I'm actually pretty excited because I've already built the crossover in the other pair and plugged in the speakers to give it a quick listen. I didn't fasten the speakers in or anything, so it was pretty rough, but I've got to say, I was pretty impressed with the preliminary sound on these. So I'm looking forward to getting these together and getting this all wrapped up. I've been looking at some of these CSS kits for nearly a year. It seems like they've had great review after great review but it's always been tough to bite the bullet on something that's a little more pricey in a do-it-yourself kit. So I think this Tori kit is a great option. As long as everything sounds good, like I'm expecting it to, it should give you enough confidence to maybe move into their upper realms of some of their more high-end kits too. A lot of the CSS kits come with uh, crossover upgrades that you can choose from. They don't offer any of those for the Tori, and that's because they believe that stepping up the drivers by moving up to one of their higher end speaker kits would be a much better value. You'd get a lot more performance out of that rather than just upgrading your crossover components. I totally get that and I would agree there. I mean, in all likelihood, the, the better performing drivers is where you're gonna see the most significant difference. Mind you, you could see some improvements with some of these upgraded crossovers, but it's gonna be a much more incremental improvement than something like a high-end driver upgrade. They do note though, swap out these crossover components as you desire. And that's really the great part about these DIY kits. You can spend as little or as much as you want on something like this. Okay, at this point, just start looking things over. Make sure you have all the A's to the A's join, B's to the B's, etc. It should be simple, but you just want to make sure you have that all correct before we start laying down any solder and making this more of a permanent connection. So now as you see here, I have everything pretty wound well tight. We are ready to solder at this point. We have nice physical connections between all of these. It should give us some pretty clean joints. So now just to let everyone know, I'm not a soldering expert, so keep that in mind, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea what you should be doing here. First, you're gonna to wanna to clean the tip, and you typically have a sponge, something like that, it's wet. You'll clean that up and it'll give you a nice polished look. Apply some solder to the tip. Uh, then, this is where a lot of people make mistakes. They try to solder the wires together by touching the solder and the iron at the same time. That's really not what we wanna do here. What we wanna do is actually apply heat from the bottom of the wire connection. So have the iron underneath the wires, uh, then meet the solder to that joint on the front side. That way it's gonna give you a nice strong joint. It's actually gonna pull into the joint and all of that that we had twisted up there is gonna have the solder pull nice and cleanly all throughout it, distributed evenly. Just some general guidance around soldering. Make sure that both your surfaces are clean when you start this. You definitely don't want any grease or anything like that. Uh, both should be secured in my case, like I said earlier, I like to twist so that there's actual physical connection rather than relying on the solder itself. You should tin the tip, like I mentioned earlier. That's when you're gonna clean it on a sponge. Uh, then you're gonna actually apply a little bit of solder to the tip. And this actually helps to heat the joint quicker. Once you apply the soldering iron to the joint, it's gonna heat it up quickly. So don't wait too long there. You should start applying solder as soon as you can because that heat is going to move throughout the wires and you have to watch out for things like that. You can loosen up connections where you don't want them to on the other end. When you're soldering this, allow the solder to flow into the joint. You'll kind of see what I mean. If you heat it from the other end and you're just working it from the top, you'll notice that the solder just kind of flows in there and pretty much disappears. And you want it to also look shiny. It shouldn't be a dull look to it at all. A shiny solder joint is typically a good one. And then of course, don't move your joint until it's been allowed to cool a little bit. Let it set up, and it only takes a few seconds, and then you should be good to go. These are just some really simple tips that you can use for good solder joints. If you practice this a little bit, it'll probably come to you pretty easily. At this point, you can take some snips and clean up some of these solder joints. 
cut off the ends if you have any extra length on the end, things like that. Just clean it up so there's less interference. And it's a lot easier that way to push things flush against the board. Once that's done, then you can just start pushing them down. It should be pretty simple to push these flat against the board so there won't be any interference when you screw this into the base of the speaker cabinet. Then if you want to take note here, this is the layout I use to run all these jumpers. And you can take a look at the joints as well. They all look pretty clean and uh, by no means an expert, like I said earlier, but all of these will do just fine and they're nice and secure connections. So remember at the beginning of the video when I said you could finish these up in a day if you wanted, you could just build a standard box, do a simple finish like Duratrex, something like that, and you could really have these running in, you know, something pretty much like a day. Well, I didn't go that route, as I mentioned earlier. I did some simple things that you see a lot of people do, some roundovers, things like that. But then where I added a little bit extra was I came up with this curvature on the top of the box. And that in itself wasn't that bad to do. Just, you know, sanding and finding the curve that I liked then copying that over to the other box. But what I ran into was we removed so much material off the top here that there was a lot of cabinet resonance in the top of the speaker cabinet because the MDF was a lot thinner at that point. So I had to come up with a solution for that. And what I did was I cut an additional brace. I had some spare maple laying around. So there's a brace that runs down the top length of the speaker cabinet. Uh, then I actually filled the top with resin um, it's around a quarter inch of resin filling the entire top of this. So all in all, that really firmed things up. The cabinet residence was no longer a problem. It's rock solid now. The cabinet actually has less resonance than the full MDF piece if I flip these upside down and knock on the bottom. So all in all, that's not a problem anymore. What's going to get interesting is how I finish it from here. I still have some really wild plans that I'm going to be doing with this, maybe mixing some other materials. So we'll just have to see how that turns out in part two of this video. So I guess we can say that we're done for today and I hope you guys stay tuned, like and subscribe and I'll see you guys on part two of this video. Thanks.